everybody, welcome to our special webinar with a dear friend, Dr. Kai-Fu Lee. Uh, Kai-Fu, a pleasure. Great Hi. to, great Th to thank spend you. time with you. Thanks, uh, Peter. Uh, you look pretty darn fresh from literally just <laughs> landing in from China, and then you're off to uh, TechCrunch Disrupt, and yeah. um, you got a busy week in, in San Francisco. Right. Uh, all sort of uh, getting ready for the launch of your new book. Uh, yeah, that's towards the end of the month. That's yeah. right. So yes. excited for that. I think we, we saw each other last uh, briefly at Singular University. Yes. And then um, before that, uh, we spent time together in your amazing offices in, in Shanghai. So uh, real, real pleasure. Let me take a second and do a proper introduction of, uh, of Dr. Kai-Fu Lee. He is chairman and CEO of Sinovation Ventures, uh, a leading technology savvy investment firm focusing on developing the next generation of Chinese high-tech companies. And uh, you have, is it like about $2 billion yeah. in management in Sinovation? That's, That's right. Amazing. Mm -hmm. um, prior to founding Sinovations, uh, uh, you were president of Google China, mm -hmm. uh, which must have been an amazing, uh, amazing experience. We, <laughs> can, right. we yes. can talk a little bit about that if you want or, or not. Sure. <laughs> um, and then previously, uh, you were an executive at Microsoft, at SGI, and at Apple. Right. Uh, amazing. So, uh, so Pal, we're, I want to talk, uh, we're going to spend about 90 minutes, uh, about half that time with you and I having a dialogue, and then half the time, uh, questions coming from yourself. Um, and it's really, I mean, for me, the conversation I want to hit on are going to be around your views on AI. Mm -hmm. I want to talk about uh, the, your views on the difference between entrepreneurship in, in China and entrepreneurship in the U.S. And I've had a chance to meet a number of the entrepreneurs that you've backed. Uh, and then I want to go into sort of a conversation also on the future of work. I mean, those are sort of the three big things that we've, we've spoken about. But um, let's, let's begin on the book. Uh, I mean, you've made, you got your PhD in, in artificial intelligence. Yes, um, in the 80s. In the yeah. 80s. Uh, and who were you studying under then? Uh, Raj Reddy at okay. Carnegie Mellon. At, at CMU. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, and you've made your career out of, uh, out of AI. And, I, I mean, AI has been around for... What fifty years, arguably, as a as a subject? Uh, strictly speaking, 60, uh, 60, 60 years. Sixty years since nineteen fifty six. Okay, yeah. and you've known Ray Kurzweil, who's also been with us. Uh, yes. We'll be having a uh, a webinar with Ray very soon too. Yeah. You guys have been friends for a while. Yeah, yeah, he's yeah. a great, amazing guy. Yeah, and, and I, I I love the I love those conversations, but so. What, let's start, what led you to write this book now? Well, I felt uh, there are a lot of um, myths and misunderstandings about AI. Uh, there is the uh, how fast super intelligence will come about question. There is the AI so far away, I don't know what it is, I don't know when it will come kind of question. Mm. And then there is a um, question about Chinese AI mm -hmm. that I think Many people don't believe or don't understand how China came to develop an AI and, uh, and is about to match the U.S. in the caliber of AI applications and usage. In fact, I, I remember recently um, Eric Schmidt, who we both know, uh, uh, was at the World Economic Forum and made a very interesting pronouncement that his expectation that was within five years, and this was over a year ago, that he thought uh, Chinese uh, entrepreneurship companies and so forth would surpass the U.S. in AI. Do you mm -hmm. think that's true? What does that mean to you? Well, I think it depends on how you measure. Mm -hmm. um, he was my former boss, but we didn't uh, uh, collaborate or discuss the subject. But I came to a similar conclusion, and I think his uh, points are correct. But if we measure by market capitalization, one could argue China is already there. Mm -hmm. If one measures by Real usage and value, probably five years is about right in applications, value created, um, types of algorithms used in products. And then if we discuss research, you know, the quality of basic research, I don't think China is at all going to be ready in five years to surpass the U.S. So I, I think 
in this book, AI superpowers, the, the reason I use the plural form is that Voila. <laughs> U.S. has no worries that it will remain one of the top two leaders for the foreseeable Interesting future. Interesting superpowers, right? Yeah. Now. But, but then it's going, it, the more interesting issue is going to be U.S. and China will be so far ahead of every other country. Yeah. And, and I don't think people in the U.S. Have, has, have ever experienced that, right? From the Wintel days to the Google Netscape days, Yahoo days, U.S. has always been the singular tech power in the internet, mobile, AI, software space. Now they're suddenly emerged out of nowhere and equal power. So the, the world order is different from that sense. Interesting. So um, I want to dive into some of the specific questions, but a few general ones first. So again, uh, your purpose in writing this book is to make people aware of that, that biopoly, if you would. Yes. Uh, the, the existence of two very powerful countries is, I think, the first point, that each has legitimately earned its place. And then I think the other important point is, what are the big issues that AI will bring about? And that I believe the future of work is the biggest issue, yeah. and that whether it's the two superpowers or other countries or any individual, we should be aware that AI is becoming smarter, taking over more routine jobs, so the future of work, future of corporations, future of education, all of that will change in the next 15 years. Sure, and it really is that fast. I mean, everything is changing. It's not our, our children or their children, it's our lifetimes that is, is happening. And I also wanna talk a little bit about what kind of companies you're investing in, if that's okay. Of course. I mean, one of the things I found fun yeah. when I, and I, I I had the pleasure to take a, a group of my abundance community members to China every year. We go at least once a year, mm -hmm. and and you've been fantastic in hosting us and showing us is some of the amazing companies that you're investing in. And yeah. Uh, how many um, unicorns have you had inside of Simulation so far? It's been uh, a number. Yeah. yeah so we've uh, funded uh, 13 unicorns. Yeah. Uh, actually, four in artificial intelligence. So that's a substantial number. Probably yeah. the largest. Yeah. So. Um, so let's, let's go back to the beginning. If you were gonna say, when did AI in China start to really uh, accelerate? How long ago was this? It's hard to believe, but two years ago. Two years ago? Yeah. That was so, whoa. Yeah. So there, you, you think that the real, the deflection point and, I mean, because I would have said for, for America, I would have gone back to the earlier days of Google, maybe 10 years ago. Yeah. Would you agree with that? I would. I would. And two years ago for China. So what happened two years ago that started this, this acceleration? Well, as I mentioned in, my, in the book, <laughs> Superpowers, yeah. it was the match between AlphaGo and Lee Sedong. Uh, not quite Kejie, the Chinese superstar, the Korean superstar. Yeah. That match, because Go was a game invented in China. The Chinese people take a lot of pride. And also, all the AI experts, including myself, have pronounced that it would take a long time, maybe decades, for AI to beat a human in Go. But AlphaGo proved us wrong um, by doing so uh, two it, years ago. It woke, it woke people up. Woke people up and said, wow, yeah. this thing is uh, amazing. And it's um, uh, a lot faster than even the experts said. What if it's applied to other areas like banking and health and education? And that really uh, drove, because everything in China moved so quickly. So much capital suddenly moved to fund AI. Every traditional company wants to learn about AI, and every uh, internet company embraced AI. And also with a large market of users, it really took off in the last two years to yeah. a point where arguably there's a little bit of a bubble right now. Yeah. Of course, we as Innovation Ventures, we started investing four years ago sure. because we saw this coming, uh, but we really didn't see the speed, Ex explosion. Uh, explosion that happened last two years. Fascinating. And so the, the capital that's going into these AI startups, um, would you say it's all private? How much is public? How much is government investments and labs and such? At this point, I think it's probably over 90% private. Yeah. Uh, to be sure, there's a lot of government funding that's going through. Uh, government rarely invests directly mm -hmm. in technology companies because no government's very good at picking the winners. Sure. Uh, the government usually participates by either rewarding s individuals, um, rewarding um, uh, ex excellent professors, returnees, and um, um, companies like that, and also 
government invests in uh, funds, which will then in further, then what the funds will invest in the AI companies. But the, the main thing about uh, Chinese government is I think uh, most people think about the dollars as to, as to what makes the Chinese um, government helping the Chinese companies. But actually, uh, that's not the main thing. Yep. I think the main thing is the techno-utilitarian approach the Chinese government takes. That is, don't debate ad infinitum about the technology, just let it launch. Mm -hmm. And then if issues come up, uh, tweak the laws. Uh, that's very different philosophy. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. It's yep. just what is done. And that causes techno technology adoption to be faster and iterated. The other thing is infrastructure building. Uh, the Chinese government is building highways and cities that will help autonomous vehicles be safer. Yeah. So that kind of mega spending, I think, on infrastructure, not on the funding of the companies, is what makes China kind of a unique place that can accelerate AI. Amazing. So in the book, you talk about the four waves of AI. Right. Uh, let's take one second and, and uh, uh, and describe those, if you would, for our viewers here. Sure. So if we look at... Um, we go to a couple of slides. Yeah, here. Just, one, just one slide for this. Yeah. It's easier to visualize. As you said, uh, the Internet AI was the first wave. Uh, these are really the same set of algorithms that underlie all four waves, uh, uh, centered around machine learning, in particular deep learning. These technologies that were advanced between five and ten years ago are now finding applications everywhere because the technologies are generally applicable with some expertise involved uh, to uh, power a Google search and all the way to an autonomous uh, vehicle. Mm -hmm. So if we think about application areas, I think they will come at different times. The earliest ones to hit are the internet applications. And the reason behind that is machine learning works by taking um, huge amount of data and with not much human intervention other than tagging the outcome. Mm -hmm. That is, you don't, if, if you want to build an um, application to give out loans, you don't have to teach it what specifically is important, uh, income, uh, address, or um, uh, rental uh, cost and things like that. You just feed all the information you can legally get on each person <laughs> and, uh, and tell it this person actually borrowed money and returned it. This yes. person borrowed money and defaulted. And you give it huge amounts of data, and then the system decides what are the important features for it to look at. This is basically neural nets and deep learning. Yes. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And then, of course, some human guidance is okay, but uh, you know, most of us would think we want to go in and program exactly how to give the loan. But actually, the more data and less programming actually makes it better. Yeah. So that makes it a magical black box that works so much better when you have more data. And coming back to our four waves, the first wave, not surprisingly, is the internet wave. Because where else do we have more data, right? The internet. All the clicks you have on Amazon or the Chinese uh, Tencent or Alibaba or uh, um, Google or Facebook, Every click you make is uh, showing some intention mm -hmm. and showing some satisfaction, purchase, or something that causes the website to know more about you. Amazon would know what, pro what things you are inclined to buy and therefore what things people like you are inclined to buy and so on. So, so they can optimize the engine to either improve the user experience, increase the usage rate, the usage time, or to maximize their profit. So that ability in that deep learning black box enabled a lot of internet companies to make a lot of money because they now had a magic um, uh, knob that allowed them to say, well, today we're going to make Amazon users um, more st sticky, stay longer. Well, now we need to monetize them better. So it's almost like having a magic uh, knob over your business. And, and that's why the current giants of AI are all internet companies. Sure. Facebook, Google, Amazon, Microsoft, and Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent. These are the seven giants. Now, of course, all the, any new internet company that's got a million daily active users, uh, the Snapchat or the Pinduoduo from China, they'll be able to use AI too. So this will go on for the internet wave. The second wave is the business wave. And that's for uh, corporations that have historical or um, uh, stored data uh, for legal reasons or, or other reasons such as 
banks have all the transactions of users, insurance companies have all the <laughs> claims of the users, hospitals have all the illnesses and treatments and symptoms and whether people were cured or survived. Uh, they have those records. And those records can now be brought to bear and teach the machine learning system uh, to perform the historical business process functions, such as banks uh, giving out loans or uh, deciding if a credit card use might be fraudulent or hospitals coming up with ways of treatment, insurance companies deciding if uh, claims are legitimate. So these business applications, typically buying AI from AI suppliers to plug into their business process, that's the second wave of AI. You know, when I'm, I'm talking to uh, uh, executives from countries around the world, I was just down in Brazil for a week meeting with, I don't know, a, a few hundred CEOs. And one of the things that none of them truly realize is that their data that they have resident is an asset that they're not counting on their books. Right, right. right? So, I mean, everybody counts their assets, their yeah. IP, their cash in the bank, mm. but they don't typically uh, either at, you know, say, my data is worth this much amount of money to us mm. at, on our books, or mm. they don't do a proper job in actually recording their phone calls with interactions with their clients and so forth. But I think people are starting to finally, finally wake up to this. You're exactly right. This is a danger and a liability that traditional companies view the data repositories as a cost center. Yeah, instead so, of a profit center, right. Yeah, so the people managing them are, how do we save money? How do we back up the data, put them on uh, cheaper storage, as opposed to how do we actively use it to make money and save money for the companies? So that mentality shift is going to differentiate the traditional companies that will win from mm -hmm. those that will lose. Yeah. Yeah. Let's go with number th your okay. third wave. Yeah, so the first two waves are with the big data that already exists in some format. The third, data is, the third wave is very interesting. I call it perception AI. Mm -hmm. So you can think about it as digitizing the physical world, collecting information in our world that, are, that were transient, you know, sounds, um, vision, scenes that really just, just go before our eyes, literally speaking, and, and we lose them. But now we have, with uh, perceptual AI, we can hear them and remember them, see them and remember them, and use them to trigger applications that were not before possible. So number one and two are doing things we could do before, but doing them better, saving money, making money. The third wave is listening and um, watching like we could never do before. For example, watching in a store so that people could autonomously pay for what they've got. Amazon Go. There. Amazon Go, Yeah. right. And then listening to your, uh, talking to your Amazon uh, Alexa Echo. And, and that speech gets stored along with the user intention. By the way, is there an analogy for Amazon Go and Alexa already throughout China deployed? <laughs> yes. Did, Every, or did it start there first and Amazon copied? No, 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 <laughs> no. Uh, uh, in these two cases, well, uh, we can come back to Chinese entrepreneurism. We will, yes. They are doing some brand new things uh, excitingly differently from U.S., but in these two cases, Amazon was the first. Yeah. And then the Chinese company said, oh, let's adopt it in a different way. So I think um, the Chinese um, Alexa equivalents are getting to a lot of places, and uh, in fact, the prices are much lower than Alexa. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the uh, computer vision, however, I think the Chinese started earlier. The autonomous store, the Amazon started as a concept, mm -hmm. but I think Chinese companies are, are uh, launching it much faster. Yeah. So there, we've, we've invested in a company called F5 Future Store that is doing autonomous fast food. So basically you go in, recognize your face, place your order, then it makes your noodles for you. You can eat there. And then we've invested in another company um, that is helping the grocery chain called Yonghui uh, gradually autonomy, autonomous um, enable their stores, mm -hmm. starting with sales forecast, automatically using computer vision to count inventory, moving to customer tracking, online, offline integration, and then eventually to automatic checkout uh, by computer vision. So we to can see. Yeah, to summarize, then wave three, wave three yeah. is again generating the data, 
and per through perception, through sensors. Through sensors, not only cameras, microphones, but also heat sensing, motion sensing, depth sensing, 3D reconstruction, LIDARs, all kinds of sensing that allows a computer to uh, basically understand what's happening in an environment, whether it's our face, our emotion, a car, a license plate, uh, someone with intent to purchase, with the actual purchase. So all of that becomes captured, making the operation, business entity, uh, offline as smart as the ones online. Like today, Amazon, with every click you have, knows exactly what you did, what you want, what you don't want. But in the future, when you go shop in a grocery store, it will have the same knowledge yeah. and therefore becoming much smarter on inventory management, sales, shelves, shelves to have put in, sales to have, discounts to use, and how to, and also teaching human assistants how to better help and assist you. It's not just a question of replacing humans. And that's just in retail. You can see that extending to um, corporate, to uh, hospitals, clinics. You can see that extending to uh, learning and uh, education, schools. So it's really everywhere. And your fourth, uh, your fourth wave is which? Well, fourth, if the third wave added years and eyes, the fourth wave adds hands and legs mm -hmm. to the AI. So it can move about, it can manipulate, it can pick things up, it can do, do things with objects. That obviously is harder because it requires mechanical engineering, dexterity, and advances that aren't as fast moving as computer vision, speech, and deep learning. But they will catch up. So the, the most um, commonly used example is autonomous vehicles. And, and that will migrate from uh, um, fixed environments like forklifts, um, parking, and mining, tourist attractions, <coughs> and um, shuttles mm -hmm. to, um, to highways and then to um, uh, public roads over time. So L1, L2, L3, L4. Similarly, uh, robots will start to happen in manufacturing. And then within manufacturing, they'll start with uh, simple things like uh, inspection. They'll go into warehouses, starting with simple things like um, uh, packaging your box that Amazon ships to you. Even so, so you're on the board of Foxconn, which is yes. one of the now largest users of robots. Yes. And growing. Right. Um, but when I think about robots, I think about, you know, uh, what our friend Mark Raybert at Boston Dynamics is doing, which is mm. some of the most, you know, extraordinary, at least yeah. visually extraordinary yes. robots. Is there, uh, who's, who's leading the construction of, of, uh, of robots in China these days? Uh, well, there are a lot of uh, companies, but the robots that are in factories don't look like Mark, Mark's robots. Yeah. Mark's robots have arms and legs. And they're like, uh, you know, animals from Black Mirror. You yeah. know? <laughs> uh, the factory robots are just machines. Yeah. They're smart machines. Think of it as Tesla factory, yeah. right? Tesla factory, in fact, uses um, robots from KUKA, which is now a subsidiary of the Chinese company uh, Medi Media. Okay. So, the, so I think a lot of the leaders in the mechanical aspects are still in Germany and Japan. Mm -hmm. Um, but through acquisition and partnership, China is growing in that space. Uh, within Foxconn, we're starting more with the inspection aspects, which are more straightforward. Because, and also, I think within manufacturing, uh, having robotics take care of industries that are slow moving was more suitable than fast moving. What I mean by that is bicycles haven't changed for a long time. Yeah. You know, um, air conditioners haven't changed that much. So robots can be built to, to do the one thing mm -hmm. uh, that's needed to build them. But phones change all the time. Yeah. So um, humans can change as phones change, make small changes, Interesting. Um, but it takes longer for manufacturing. That's a fascinating, fascinating idea. You know, one question that's asked of me, and I want to hear your answer so I can become smarter, is when you look at the seven tech giants in the AI world, is it a winner take all, in other words, at some point, their advantage over someone coming in yeah. is so much greater in terms of their intellectual, their data sets, their computational power. Yeah. Uh, you know, would you ever see, uh, is this a runaway success? What are your thoughts? I think it's definitely 
it's a great dividend for them and great expansion opportunities mm -hmm. because um, in the consumer space, internet space, app space, these seven giants have more data than anyone else and it's easier for them to extend into new spaces that are contiguous and can leverage their strength. However, if we, as we look at these four waves, it's unclear whether these seven giants have an advantage in healthcare or in insurance or in um, schools or in retail or in factories or in autonomous vehicles. Mm -hmm. uh, they're going to try, just like you know, Waymo is the leader. They're from Alphabet, Google, but it's uh, unclear that Google advantages will easily uh, lev be leverageable into mm -hmm. Waymo uh, other than the smart people and the deep learning algorithms. Yeah. So I think there will be the room for, a room for many other giants in the waves two, three, and four, although the first wave, uh, they're likely to get most of the, uh, the benefits. Let's talk about some of the companies. So you're, you've got $2 billion. Um, uh, what are the fun, most interesting AI companies that you've been investing in? Mm. Well, we've invested in about uh, 45 or so AI companies. Mm. Uh, some of them are in areas where we're just, so in each of the waves, we sure. have some companies. In the first wave, we have uh, Meitu, which is an internet app that uh, beautifies your selfies. Mm -hmm. So it uses AI to make, it's like Instagram, but except it's for selfies. Right. So it's an interesting application, but, but, but you gotta first have the users, and then based on their behavior, you know, if they save a photo, you know, it's a good tag. If they delete it, you know, it's a bad tag. And then you learn how to make people more beautiful according to their desires over time. So that's a phase one, wave one. Um, and then in wave two, we have a unicorn called uh, Fourth Paradigm. Mm -hmm. uh, they basically help banks build up a customer profile, which includes not only all the bank's information about individual, but all the publicly searchable uh, content of, of individuals so that they can create an estimate of the individual's net worth and therefore have stronger targeting of new products to them. Say you maybe, let's say you have you know, $500 million, but you only keep uh, 50,000 in the bank. Right. But the public records show you own a lot of properties and so on. Um, so the bank should be smarter to target its um, uh, investment products to you that are for high net worth individuals. Mm -hmm. So these are the smart things they allow companies to do, not to mention, also include, includes, of course, you know, credit card fraud detection, uh, asset allocation optimization. So, and everything they do, once you use their platform, um, every, of the, every one of the existing bank's normal processes uh, um, become more optimized with higher uh, user conversion rates for product sales, lower fraud rates for credit cards, and, and banks can really see money accumulate to the bottom line when they buy the software. So. I, uh, I talk to my, my digital members a lot about uh, a few of the companies that you've introduced me to, like, play, like Face++. Plus Plus, yep, that's a which, fa wave three. Yep. Yeah, mm -hmm. so ta what is Face++ Plus Plus able to do? Well, Face++ Plus Plus started doing face recognition yes. uh, with the core technologies. They didn't know what apps to use. And then as they started probing uh, apps, they found there were so many. Uh, the, they were invested by Ant Financial, which is a um, sister company to Alibaba. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, in the US, when you use a credit card and sometimes um, they think the usage is uh, suspicious, so they call you and ask you 20 questions about where you went to high school. Uh, that's very annoying. I get those calls all the time with my US credit cards. <laughs> but in China, uh, actually, people don't use credit cards that much anymore. They use uh, Alipay, for example. Sure. And then they use Alipay, and it looks suspicious. Instead of calling and asking all these annoying questions, they just said, uh, look at the, um, um, the camera, the camera yeah. and uh, open your mouth, make a smile, go to the left side, smile again. This way, nobody can fake a face because yeah. you can't put on a mask or, or put up a picture because they make you make faces, and then, and then that validates you. Even though it's weird to make faces, it's a lot less annoying than asking, <laughs> answering 20 <laughs> questions. So that was a, it's a big anti-fraud step they took. Yeah. Also, they're uh, deployed in you know, airports for passport checking, and uh, also for 
that we deployed them in our front door. When you came and visited us, yeah. uh, we opened the doors by our faces. So you could not uh, get in without, you, had, you would have to go through the receptionist. But the receptionist can ignore us. We just walk through. We have no badges in the company. Awesome. So they found many, many applications, you know, obviously like iPhone, they have the unlocking of the face uh, and um, their uses in, in um, financial, banking, corporations, security. And, and now they're moving beyond face. So they can um, actually, in China, if you jaywalk, you could get a ticket uh, automatically through face recognition. I'm just glad the they're bill. not here in the United States. <laughs> right. I don't think those would be popular here, no. <laughs> So it was, I remember another company you told me about was a company that is uh, looking at manufacturing machine learning capability in a $5 chipset. Yes, yes. Yeah. We have several companies doing chipsets. Yeah. Uh, one called Horizon Robotics. Uh, they have been looking at uh, consumer applications and the need for AI to get cheaper. Yeah. And the high-end chips, NVIDIA makes them. But if you want them to go into cameras and the like. Or my kids' uh, toys. Uh, the toys, yeah. exactly. So uh, under $5 is kind of a magic sweet spot uh, that can go into the toy um, that would allow Amazon Echo capability into a toy. Uh, we actually have two chip investments. Both are unicorns. Uh, one is Horizon Robotics, mm -hmm. um, and uh, second is called Bitmain. And what they did is they actually started doing uh, machines for um, complete systems and chips for, uh, for uh, cryptocurrency mining. And then they found that those chips have similar characteristics as the AI chips because both have to have very fast matrix multiplies. Then they branched into AI chips as well. And both companies are, are, are unicorns in our portfolio. That's, uh, these would be third, fourth wave. We also have four autonomous vehicle companies, uh, one of which uh, called Momenta well, is, going, is China's first unicorn in autonomous vehicle. Mm -hmm. Uh, they basically built a primarily computer vision based L3 system mm -hmm. and deployed it with a very clever mechanism. And they have a very fast way to build um, high definition maps so that they can now add, um, add LiDAR and do L4 as well. So digital map is a very high profit licensing business in an autonomous vehicle. And we have uh, another uh, autonomous vehicle company doing trucks and another one doing um, uh, non-public roads, so things like shuttles. Uh, and then we have uh, a final one that's going directly to L4, and they've demonstrated that they could run in very heavy rain and inside tunnels, I mean, really world-leading technologies in L4 autonomous driving. So uh, I coach <coughs> a large number of entrepreneurs in my, in my Abundance Digital community, and we spend time every day or every week talking about how to be a great entrepreneur or raising capital. I love the conversations we had when we were together about entrepreneurship in China yeah. and um, the difference between entrepreneurs in the United States, entrepreneurs in China, and there's some lessons to be learned that I want to share with, sure. with my community. Um, and, uh, you know, I remember just one of them, we walked away uh, with uh, an abundance community talking about, uh, you know, 996 as, as a toast. Yeah. Um, uh, let's, let's jump in of what is it, you know, w talk about the entrepreneur in China who yeah. starts the company, what they're like, w what's the ethos, and, and let's, let's compare and contrast a little bit. Yeah, okay. I think, you know, um, the... Chinese entrepreneurs start in a very tough environment with very little funding and just... Uh, How long ago? If you think about just when Netscape, um, when Google started, yeah. uh, China had only, I think, less than 1%. Um, sorry, when Netscape started, China, U.S., sorry, <laughs> when, uh, in the, in the late 90s. Yeah, and when so China Google's went, went, 98, 99. Yeah, I forgot the exact date, but... Yeah. Um, when U.S. had 30% internet penetration, yeah. China had 0.2%. Right. Um, I forgot which year it is, but it, it's, 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 a, it's a ratio of yeah. one, 150 uh, between the two in penetration. So um, a lot of early entrepreneurs, basically, they, uh, they were copycats. And, and uh, 
And, and for that reason, I think most people in Silicon Valley look down upon the Chinese entrepreneurs as well. They'll never be innovate, innovative. But that really proved to be completely wrong um, for the following reason. When the penetration was 0.2%, you didn't have enough a space to really try something. Experiment, right. Experiment, right. But then, uh, as China market exploded uh, to now um, you know, four, four or five times larger than the US market, uh, and then capital flew in, a magical virtual cycle suddenly formed in the last 10 years. And that circle is a huge market draws capital, and then the capital creates smart VCs who will uh, invest in and coach entrepreneurs. And entrepreneurs will make great companies, and then in a very competitive environment, uh, they will make great products, which then draws even more users on the board. So this virtual cycle, once it starts running, it's, it, it grows uh, very, very rapidly. And, the, and another very unique Chinese characteristic is the competition is really, really tough. Mm -hmm. um, so in the US, I think the competition is fairly gentlemanly. You know, Pinterest would say, okay, that's Instagram space, we won't do that. And then uh, you know, uh, eBay uh, would say, okay, that's Amazon's expertise, so we'll let them do that. In China, it's like a coliseum. <laughs> and then only one winner emerges, everybody else is dead. And that is the spirit Br in which... Brutal. Brutal. <laughs> so, so people come up, actually are forced to come up with a lot um, tougher business, competitive, uh, clever ideas. Yeah. Uh, for example, on eBay, even today, you still pay money per transaction. In China, a decade ago, Taobao was free everything, uh, except not for ads. Right, they make money purely off of ads like Google AdWords. Mm -hmm. on zero, no, no, free to list, free to sell, even free to transact. Uh, but if you want to be noticed, you gotta pay for that. That turned out to be a much more sustainable business model. And then the Chinese companies, look at Uber as an example. Yeah. Very, originally a very smart company and with very good technologies, but a very thin layer of uh, just uh, matching drivers and uh, riders. In China, the, the Uber of China, DD, what they do is they're not just investing in building the Uber layer for the sh ride sharing. Uh, they're going into uh, buying cars, loaning cars, bank loans for buying cars and leasing cars from them, as well as car insurance and um, um, car repair. Much deeper and, into the stack, into the and, financial stack. And yeah. gas stations. Yeah. So now suddenly when you're a DD driver, you get all the benefits and they leverage off each other and get better services because, and also you can't lie about your traffic accidents because you're in the repair shop. So DD gets more knowledge, they get to keep the best of the drivers. And that, but another really important side effect of this, or you could say the main purpose, is they don't left, that would not allow another lift to happen to Uber. Because if you have a new company come, that wants to come into the space, well, you don't get all the benefits from all the, that DD offers its drivers. In fact, DD drivers won't be allowed to drive for another um, um, ride-sharing company. And here we see a lot of Uber and Lyft drivers both driving for both. Yeah. Right, and that's what happens when you have a lightweight approach. Yeah. You look at OpenTable and um, Yelp in the US, nice light layer company worth maybe a billion or two. In China, Meituan is a $60 billion company. They hired 600,000 people on electrical uh, mopeds to deliver food to the homes. So in the US, delivery of a eat out is about $10 per order. For Meituan, it's about 60 cents. So is it tip, you're, you're saying it's winner take all. There is, is there a one in, num, uh, one in two? I mean, there is, there is, you know, both Alipay and Tencent has their own pay. Yes. Uh, platform. So there is some duopoly yes. there. Uh, there can be. Um, the, in most spaces uh, with the giants, I think they will have enough leverage from their other businesses to ensure they don't get squeezed out. Mm -hmm. But smaller companies, you know, when Groupon started in China, there were 3,000, oh sorry, 5,000 companies doing Groupon-like companies. Okay. And only one left called Meituan. So it's truly a coliseum. And then now Meituan wants to get into other businesses. So they got into movie tickets, they won that one, and then they got into travel, they're doing pretty well, and then they now want to get into ride sharing, but as I said, Didi's putting up all these um, 
barrier uh, to entry. Barrier, yeah. so it's not clear they'll succeed. So, so let's, so I mean, as an <clears throat> entrepreneur, just take this, take this in. So a couple of things. Uh, let's talk about, first of all, one thing that you said to me that makes a lot of sense is a U.S. entrepreneur, many that I've backed in through my venture fund or you've yeah. backed, uh, view the U.S. as their primary market mm -hmm. and China is something theoretical. Yeah. But yeah. when you back a Chinese entrepreneur, yeah. how are they thinking? About their primary market? About, about the US, <coughs> China and the U.S. Uh, they don't dream of getting into the U.S. market either mm -hmm. because the markets are different, the dynamics are different, the demographics are different, language, culture are different. Um, you have to learn a whole new set of stack when you move to the U.S. Mm -hmm. Like instead of WeChat advertising, you have to do Facebook advertising. And then the usage patterns and paying patterns are all different. So uh, generally speaking, U.S. and Chinese companies will each stay in its respective market. Mm -hmm. And then they might both expand to other adjacent markets with similar demographics. But uh, there hasn't been much heads-on competition between the American giants or the Chinese giants. What do you think about work ethic between the two? between entrepreneurs in both countries? Right. Uh, well, I know that most of America thinks Silicon Valley is very hard working, but when I take entrepreneurs from China to visit Silicon Valley, it's usually two sentences in conclusion. Uh, so creative, but so not hard working. <laughs> <laughs> in China, you know, a company that just went public recently, used to be a startup, yeah. used to advertise, come work for us, you can get work-life balance. We only need you to put in 996. Yes. That's 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. six days a week. And that's considered work-life balance, light week. Yes. Um, many startups are 9127, 997. I'm not so advocating that. 9 a.m. to midnight, <laughs> seven days a week. I mean, people live to work. Yeah. That is uh, both a great thing for the entrepreneurial growth and yeah. a very worrisome thing when yeah. we think about uh, the future. I mean, I, I did find that, um, so a couple of the things that I found uh, in our conversations in China that really woke me up, the first was the work ethic uh, yeah. is uh, a order magnitude against traditional U.S. work ethics. But the second thing was the CEO in, uh, in the Chinese entrepreneurial company really dominates. Yeah. There's none of this opinions of the workforce. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, and I think this may be cultural. It, it might is, also, it is cultural, but still. Yeah, it, yeah, but also maybe based on what has worked and hasn't worked. Yeah. Uh, a lot of in Silicon Valley companies' greatness comes from having multiple founders who have different expertise and roughly equal shares of the company or similar shares. In China, usually one person dominated uh, both the decisions and the shares, uh, and the company looked up to that individual for its vision, for it, when it's in difficulty to cheer people up and to make tough decisions about competition, new markets and strategy. That made the Chinese companies more efficient, uh, but obviously you know, less ability to bring into bear lots of different ideas from all the people and build consensus. Because I remember in some of our conversations, you described that when the CEO said, we're going that way, mm -hmm. There was no question no. the organization got up and marched in that direction. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Although the best CEOs are ones who will listen to people for their input and then make the decision. Uh, and knowing that the responsibility lies in him or her, but not feel like it, he or she needed no input. The other thing is in the modern days with the internet related business, a lot of, a lot of decisions are data driven. So yeah, if there's sure. data to help guide the decision, they don't tend to be wrong compared to just subjective decision making. Any other lessons that you think uh, U.S. entrepreneurs <coughs> can learn from Chinese entrepreneurs that, uh, that haven't been shared really? I think the work ethic is uh, one that's most striking, but I actually don't think that's the primary issue. I think the Silicon Valley entrepreneurs like really lightweight technical layers that lead to massive profits and don't want to do <coughs> really ugly, dirty, sweaty work like managing 600,000 people on mopeds. But if you really want to build an impregnable business model, you probably have to dig deep, do the tough work. There are obviously American companies that do that. Mm -hmm. Amazon is a great example. 
And I think there's something to be said beyond the lightweight magic wand, you know, 10 engineers make a billion dollars kind of uh, fairy tale stories. Uh, there's something to be learned about doing the really tough, sweaty, ugly work that's capital intensive and um, that really makes your business impregnable. These 600,000 people who ride mopeds uh, drove the cost down from several dollars per delivery to 60 cents. Mm -hmm. And that's what made, that changed the entire eating habit of the Chinese people. Because now people don't need to go to restaurants anymore. Uh, because you know, 60 cents per order can be absorbed into the price of ordering. So essentially, it's Amazon Prime, uh, yeah. except now with eat out, uh, and you don't even have to pay the Prime membership. So when you want a massive change like that, it's the hard work that it takes to optimize every little detail can ma and can and does matter. Yeah, and I mean, you cover a, a lot of these these principles here, and then layer on top of that. Uh, the power of AI, right. and I think one thing that makes China also uh, prime for this is the access to an amount of data. Yes, I mean everything is being is imaged and recorded, yeah. and the data yeah. is rich and usable. Yeah, China has uh, you know three times more mobile users than the U.S., but ten times more eat out orders because of what I described. Yeah, and then uh, take out orders, fifty times more mobile transactions all of which are very useful data, 300 times more in shared bicycle ride data, which is actually IoT data. So that massive amount of more data will help train better AI models. Yeah, so I mean, when you're, when you're thinking about starting a company, and we, we spend <coughs> a lot of time talking about this in, in our abundance community, is you know, what are, besides where are you making your money, right? How are you driving towards, uh, towards, towards cash flow, but ultimately, how can you be collecting uh, unfair advantage data uh, that is <clears throat> delivering value to your consumers, your clients, but also training up algorithms and capabilities that uh, you have that no one else has? Um, let's go into our, our third topic, and then we'll, we'll open up to questions from you uh, about, about any aspect of AI superpowers and Kai Fu's work. Uh, which is the future of work. And yep. you and I have talked about this uh, a bunch. I spent a lot of time talking about this with, uh, with my dear friend, Tony Robbins. Yeah. Uh, we talk about, Ray and I talk about this. We talk about this in the abundance community and, and at SU. What are your thoughts about, uh, about uh, robotics and AI? Are they killing jobs? Are you concerned? Are you concerned about people's meaning of life? What are your thoughts right now? Sure. I, th I think sometimes people want and give a simplistic answer to the question, but there's actually a very nuanced and complex answer mm. because it uh, depends on what types of job you look at. AI can be a job displacement agent, or it can be a great tool, or it can be irrelevant. Yeah. So if we want to separate that, uh, one easy way I come up with to look at it is ask the question, what can AI not do, at least at present not do? And then so I'm and, and also in the next 10 or 20 years, what can it not do? Uh, yeah, in my, in my projection. Obviously, yes. Ray may disagree yeah. and think AI will uh, wipe out more of our work than, than I think. But this is my view. All right. So one aspect is the creativity of a job. If we purely look at the creativity we'll go to angle. We'll the slides here now, yeah. Yeah, let's switch the slides. We'll see that there are repetitive jobs, routine jobs, and even optimizing job with advanced jobs like radiologists, which in 15 year time frame can be done by AI. I, I, I would imagine in a five-year time frame can be done by AI. But well, uh, it's, okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm seeing amazing companies in that area. Yes, I think this, there's also the adoption issue. There right? is the adoption yeah. issue. Those but, damn yeah. humans are slow to adopt. That's right, and the patients may not want it and so on. <laughs> but but you know, whether it's five or 15, it's, yeah. a, it's a finite time yeah. frame. So this picture would have you worried because it only leaves very few jobs, like CEOs and scientists. Uh, for people to have, and a lot of jobs seem to be wiped out. But there is another angle um, that I believe we should look at, which is that of um, human touch and compassion. And if, if we make that the X, Y axis, mm -hmm. that is service jobs that require a human to human interaction, compassion, empathy as the Y axis, then we could replot these jobs, and you can see some jobs require a lot of 
empathy. Uh, I, I, some people argue CEO shouldn't be at the <laughs> upper right side, but uh, maybe compassion, not clear, but empathy for sure. Yep. Otherwise, how do you manage the team and, and know what people M are thinking? M&A experts should be brutal, not compassionate. <laughs> uh, well, they, they need to understand human nature. Okay. They have huge human interaction. So the labeling is tough. You know, it's compassion, empathy, knowing human, and interacting with human, all those things mixed on the y-axis. Yeah. Okay, so now we've populated the um, uh, uh, right side and the lower left side, and we can see the lower left side is the really group that's endangered mm -hmm. because they don't have that much creativity and they don't have uh, that much human interaction. But what jobs remain? Uh, I would argue there are actually a lot of jobs that uh, would grow uh, in the face of AI. For example, a doctor may they may have a great uh, sign a tool AI tool for diagnosis. But you don't want the cold tool to pronounce how many years you have to live. Uh, and you want the compassion, the people. I mean, you're a physician. I mean, that you understand how important the phys yeah. human touch is. Well, put, put differently, and to, and to share this with you, I remember when my, when my father was passing away, uh, you know, he's in the, uh, in the hospital room, and you've got every specialist coming in and looking at his his brain, his hips, his heart, but no one looking at the full patient. Exactly. Right? And right. so the question is, can you, yeah. can you give uh, physicians or healthcare workers yeah. um, a vacation from analyzing the data to look right. at the human and be compassionate in that regard? Exactly. Yeah. And, and also, not nearly enough people have access to a good physician. The training of physician takes too long. So with AI, I think we can train a lot more uh, you can call it compassionate caretakers mm -hmm. who have medical knowledge, who might be somewhere between a nurse practitioner and a doctor today, and we can help all the poorer regions and countries, and you can visit patients at home, take care of elderly people, and there can be 10 times more doctors than today. The same with uh, 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 teachers, financial planners, beauty consultants, elderly caretakers, so that those jobs could increase, and we could even think about someone who would homeschool, mm -hmm. um, and that could be a profession. Why, why should we not let that happen and have its compensation? A elderly companion, not just to cure someone or to, but to talk to them and uh, to, uh, you know, older people don't want robots to talk to. So hotline specialists, there'll be a lot of social workers needed for the people uh, who are displaced by AI. So my point with this chart is if we want to think about the four quadrants, there's really the lower left side, which is basically going to be replaced by AI. People in those jobs should think about retraining. There are the jobs on the lower right side, which are the scientists, um, uh, uh, researchers, and uh, people who invent new, new drugs, and people who uh, write uh, novels. They will use AI as tools mm -hmm. to, to amplify their creativity, but mostly it's their genius. On the upper left side are the AI <coughs> analytical engines wrapped around with human warmth, like the teachers and doctor example. And then the upper right side is largely still human, uh, occasionally using AI as tools. So I think we need to recognize that uh, depending on which type of a job, there is potentially a different outcome. And then and I think if you step back and look at the, 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 the numbers, just as we saw about uh, you know, 100, 200 years ago, humans went through from agriculture, um, uh, agricultural jobs to manufacturing jobs. I think we're gonna be looking at manufacturing and white collar repetitive jobs to the empathy, compassionate jobs. Interesting. That is only segment large enough to absorb the number of people who yeah. need to be retrained. And by the way, as, as you guys <laughs> know, and I, I as I talk about this and teach this, that the world's biggest problems, the world's biggest business opportunities, you know, creating businesses around how do you retrain individuals and how do you make them AI literate and how do you really create that partnership is a huge opportunity uh, for the future. Oh, yeah. definitely, yeah. yes. Um, so I have a quick question here. So Ray uh, projects uh -huh. uh, human level AI by 2029 and he's, yeah. he's made that projection and he's sticking with it. Mm. Um, do you want to comment on that? Uh, sure. Uh, he and I had a dialogue at your university yes. about that. Yeah. Uh, I'm not so optimistic about that will happen. I, I feel that we don't have the engineering 
um, milestones that are known for that to happen. Uh, it, certainly, it is possible, it is plausible, but if we look at how many breakthroughs do we need mm -hmm. uh, for that to happen, I would argue perhaps at least a dozen breakthroughs. Breakthroughs about uh, common sense reasoning, breakthroughs about multi-domain planning, uh, ability to um, uh, uh, conceptualize, and then also self-awareness, self emotion, uh, those are all parts of our human capability compared to uh, deep learning, which while it's very accurate, it's just a pattern recognizer. So going from this super pattern recognizer to this all-encompassing capability, if it requires 12 breakthroughs, if we go back and say, how many breakthroughs have we had in the last six years of AI, I would argue we've only had one, that is deep learning. Okay. So we need a dozen more. Um, we, had four, we had one in 60 years, so if we want to have a dozen in the next, uh, what is it, 11 years, yeah. uh, I think it'll be, uh, we'll need to see some momentum before I start to uh, but you have accept. But you have to admit, the amount of capital going into AI now yes. is yes. growing by orders of magnitude. You've yes. got Masasan from SoftBank committing you know, yes. hundreds of billions of dollars in yes. robotics and AI. Yes. So you guys are going to find out, right, 11 <coughs> years from now is not too long. That's I think right. 11 years back was yeah. 2007, just before the financial recession. Um, it's it's going to be a fun adventure ahead. We'll see. Um, we will see. So um, AI Superpowers, by the way, is coming out when? September 25th. September 25th. So yeah. commend this to everybody. I mean, it's beautifully well written and with great story, and it's, it's something you can consume over a weekend, um, and just, in, you know, at the end of the day, if, if you're technically excited about the world, and if you get the idea that China is truly going from deceptive to disruptive, and AI is at the knee of the curve in terms of as a tool for an entrepreneur, and it's entering every single industry, there's not a single industry it's not gonna be entering, understanding how fast it's coming and where it's going, I think is, is fundamental, you can't ignore that. The other thing, by the way, is it's not a linear progression. It really is, is growing exponentially, and it's hard to, to think in that, in that fashion. Uh, what I'd love to do, pal, is actually okay. open up to, uh, to questions from our, our Abundance Digital community and, um, and dive in. So we've got uh, Sounds great. AJ here. Okay, uh, absolutely. I... Yeah, we've got questions pouring in from the digital community, and People watching the live stream. The yeah. first one comes from Stephen yeah. from the U.S. He, he asks, as someone learning the technical side of AI, where should I focus my efforts now to set myself up for success over the next decade or two? Okay, please. Sure. Uh, well, I, I think Stephen, if you're uh, into doing fundamental research, uh, I think overcoming some of the fundamental problems of AI are the key areas to go after. Um, today, the, the brittleness of the day AI or the fragility of AI are around, why do we need so much data? Why can we not generalize? Why can we not cross domains? Compared to as a human can compared do. Compared to human, yeah. yeah. And then why can we not truly understand and explain? So those are some of the things that are still basic research, but will have large commercial ramifications. So for common. example, a human might see two or three photos of a cat and be able to generalize what a cat is. Exactly. Versus an AI that probably needs to see hundreds of thousands yeah. of pictures, if not more, yeah. the more the better. Yeah. Um, so I think that those are the things, um, and I think Jeff Hinton has called for uh, the research community to look beyond deep learning, and I'm sure Ray would agree with that. I think those are all good research directions. But if you want to capitalize on the commercial uh, opportunities, then I think deep learning actually hasn't been milked nearly enough for its value. So it's a completely different answer if you want to go research or commercial. Uh, if you think about the four waves, uh, deep learning has barely scratched the surface of all the applications possible. Um, I would look for any area that's actually single domain, requires lar has large amounts of natural data and tagging, and can provide financial benefits and look for entrepreneurial or large company or traditional companies that can quickly capitalize on that. So totally different answer. One last thing I would say is the 
the barrier of you applying AI in industrially is coming down. So uh, don't assume that you're an AI expert and that uh, you, this, this, without continuing to advance your uh, capabilities, uh, you, you will continue to have that status. We've got you know, hundreds of thousands of students, if not millions, rushing in in US and China and, and the ease of use of AI is coming down a lot. So be thinking more about how the broad world is adopted, not so much on uh, uh, the, the uniqueness of your expertise that you had up to this point. But we've gone in, we're now in the era of implementation of AI in the industrial sense. Yeah, I would, I would add the notion that, uh, uh, that the number of students learning from everything from classically at the top universities in China and the United States but also from massive online like MOOCs like yeah. uh, Udacity is yeah. exploding. Yeah. One of the other things is if you can't be an expert in AI, uh, you can be the expert in the problem space and then find an AI expert to partner with, mm -hmm. right? Just you know, the middleman's gonna get destroyed in all of these processes, but if you understand the fundamental uh, problems of a, of a field uh, or are great at deploying machine learning, deep learning, that's where the great partnerships are coming out of. Right. Awesome. Next, we've got a, another question here from Francis who asks, what is your opinion on open AI? How do we ensure that no one company or country has the most concentration of AI knowledge and or power? Hmm. So this is an area you think about a lot. Yes, yes. Well, the AI community turns out to be a very open and sharing one. Uh, um, actually went all the way back to my thesis in the 80s. I remember my advisor, Raj Reddy, uh, telling the, um, the funders and also uh, to involve the uh, National Institute of Standards and Technology uh, to standardize on the data set and um, on which all participants who get funding need to use the same data set for training. And then they, when they show the results, they need to explain how they got it. So that had a massive um, impact because um, everyone can trust everyone else's results. And when someone got a good result, they would read their paper, others would read their paper and catch up as well. Uh, and then as time grew on, people uh, shared their algorithms, they published their papers in real time uh, on archives, uh, even before journals and conferences, and then open source is full of good algorithms. So I think the research community is a force to be reckoned with in some sense uh, it's naturally open, uh, almost like the Linux movement. So I see that in those in the, are the cultural DNA roots of the AI research community worldwide, and I think that's a very positive thing. Having said that, uh, some companies do have a lot of amazing talent, and they can choose to uh, not publish or share their innovations. So I think um, uh, those, I think the likelihood that any one company will know something that they can hide when the whole world is progressing is not high. Um, but um, I, there are efforts such as partnership in AI um, and, and, uh, and open AI, in fact, in itself and other efforts that try to uh, push people to, to, to be more open and to, to, the, to agree to certain principles of um, uh, sharing what they have and uh, not violating certain principles while they can still pursue their commercial success. So I think we're still in the early stages of corporate governance. Uh, I think managing countries is tough. I'm not sure how we ever um, control any one country to uh, not keep its advantage. Uh, in fact, countries are not the power units in this um, equation. I see mm. it as the tech giants are the ones who have the most um, uh, uh, um, at risk and therefore to protect. And then we see the academic, acad academic community uh, being very connected and aligned in wanting to be open. So I'm, I'm not as worried as, as most people are on this subject. So uh, uh, George asks, Dr. Lee, what do you think could be the next <coughs> wave, the fifth wave of AI, mm -hmm. perhaps beyond deep learning and convolutional neural nets, et cetera? Right. Um, well, 
I think um, Ray's coming on soon, right? <laughs> uh, I think Ray Kurzweil has a lot of bigger ideas. Those may very well become fifth, sixth waves and so on. For example, um, a fully intelligent uh, uh, humanist agent that uh, remembers everything in a corporation or for a person that can recall and um, a delegation interface where we can tell the assistants what we want to accomplish and it figures out the steps to carry those out. Or a little bit of Google duplex there. Yeah, yeah, I think we're, I mean Google and other companies are trying, trying to get there. And, and Ray also speaks uh, eloquently and passionately about the whole idea of the brain computer interface. Right. right? Uh, so, you know, 20, mid 2030s, 2033, 2035, where mm -hmm. we're connecting the neocortex with the cloud. I think could be a, a, a paradigm for a, an option for a, a follow-on paradigm. Mm -hmm. I think those are, it, it's, it's hard to project um, too, 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 uh, too accurately going forward. Like when we started with the internet, people just had browsers and websites. Little did we know that portal search engines, ads, social network, e-commerce, uh, online to offline, uh, mobility would all come about. Um, so I think uh, we're at a stage where I think we can sort of predict four waves, but we know in our hearts there will be 10 or 20 waves uh, going forward. Mm. So Paul asks an interesting question. He says, what are your thoughts on bias, both conscious and unconscious, in mm. AI? How do we deal with that as a potential issue? Yeah, that is a big question um, that's raised in the, in the, in the, in, by a lot of people. Uh, AI is trained by data, so... Um, one argument is, therefore, it has less bias than people inherently. Okay. I happen to believe that, for the most part, um, if you train it the right way. For example, think about giving out a loan. You could argue if a loan officer, um, how, so that depends on how do you label the data, right? If a loan officer goes in and says, this person looks good, looks good, doesn't look good, doesn't look good, you, you don't know what bias they have, um, you know, gender, racial, and age, and so on. Uh, that are marked by the person. Um, at least with an AI algorithm, loan, determining to give someone a loan or not is purely based on past history of other people paying back the loan. So at least it's object uh, objectively separating the people who pay back from those who don't. Now, you could still argue and say, well, um, because of past biases and prejudices, we need to overcorrect to ensure that certain factors are not considered in giving out a loan. Well, then you, you as your bank can decide, okay, we're going to, uh, let's, take, um, let's take an example that uh, I'm in the uh, disadvantaged category, age. <laughs> uh, we're going to not let age be a consideration, not discriminate against old people, or young people for that matter. Then just remove age from your data. Then, then that you can intentionally avoid age-based bias that way. Mm. So I think there are various ways you could do. But every time you remove a feature from consideration by the AI algorithm, you have to understand you're making it less precise and less capable. And, and you just have to make that ethical trade-off. Um, but I do believe, uh, uh, an example I really like in uh, the book Second, Second Machine Age by Brynolfsson and McAfee, uh, they give the example of biases in judges. And you would think judges are the least biased, but they studied in Israel. Uh, the judges are, give harsher sentencing uh, before lunch compared to uh, after lunch. <laughs> you know, when you're hungry, you're grumpy, you know. So I, I would argue data on, in general will be less, uh, uh, be doing less bias, at least non-intentional, non-malicious non, um, uh, bias. And then if we really want to further make it super unbiased, you can remove certain facts first from, from consideration. So Dante asks, what is Dr. Lee's view on the timeline for quantum computing coming online commercially? What does quantum computing mean for AI? Good question. Mm. That's a tough one. I can't be certain about the, the answer, but I'll tell you what I, I think. Um, a lot of people are studying quantum computing. There are optimists and pessimists, but I think there is general agreement that quantum computing will make a big contribution to the field of computing. 
the question is whether it's targeted in specific applications, such as security, or is it more broad to such as AI, or is it even broader that it could bring about AGI because it's so much more powerful. Uh, I think at this point I would tend to be a little conservative, and uh, I, based on what I see and understand, I think for certain computations it will bring about some big uh, breakthrough level changes, but I would be hesitant to jump to the conclusion that it would enable uh, artificial general intelligence or dramatically change the field of AI. Uh, but it's an area that people publish and will see, we see results, and then uh, based on progress, uh, I and others will update our projections. So Anita asks, will AI help demonetize education? How are you investing in education technology broadly at Sinovation? Hmm. Demonetize meaning make it, cheap, make it make cheap or free. Yeah. Uh, yes, I do. Um, but it's interestingly that it's through monetizing education that enables the deem not monetizing. So we fund a number of education companies. Uh, VIP Kid is probably the most well known one that connects uh, English teaching English teachers in the U.S. with uh, Chinese kids who want to learn English because there are not enough native English speakers in China. As you can anticipate, as it now gets to 600,000 pupils uh, actively learning and paying American teachers, there's great data that could be gathered uh, and, and then AI could be applied to that. I mean, you can, you can basically have an AI uh, observe and learn uh, which English speaking teachers teach the students mm -hmm. the best and right. then uh, and then learn to replicate that. That's right. I think the first step is uh, like an Uber platform that keeps the good teachers and recommends the right ones for the right kids. But you could project, as I think you're thinking, uh, can you simulate a teacher, yeah. right? That's I mean, very possible. I mean, so it's, it's, it's important here, guys, just to think about this one second, which is when you think about Uber, you think about Tesla, and you think about uh, all of the miles that are being driven um, and you think about, oh, that's their, that's their business. It's where they make their money by, you know, charging more and then paying the driver less. But the reality is the data sets that are being created about where people live and where, which people go to which locations. And then when every time I drive my Tesla and it's an autopilot and I take control of the wheel again, and now the Tesla knows where I as the driver felt the most uncomfortable and sends five seconds of video before and five seconds of video later. All of that is learning. And so on mm -hmm. VIP Kids, and I met yeah. the amazing, you know, your amazing Cindy. CEO, yeah. Cindy there, she's yeah. incredible, driven, passionate, mm -hmm. right? Her, her, her mission was to help connect, and I mean, number one, meet the needs of the student, which is give them access to great native English speakers in the United States. But number two, in the United States, we teach, we, we, we treat our teachers so poorly. They make so much and so little money. Yeah. It's a great platform for them to make more money. But you wouldn't have thought about that all of the teaching and interactions is data creation, which is the true wealth mm -hmm. that potentially is going to be created here in the fine run, yeah, long run. Yeah, that's right, exactly. And beyond that, we, have, we see in China uh, companies that are doing pure AI education, for example, installed in classrooms. Uh, to, to uh, take roll call and attendance, to uh, tell teachers uh, which students appear to need more help in what areas based on their classroom behavior. I know in the U.S. that probably is not appropriate, but in China it does work. <laughs> uh, um, also automatically grade exams for teachers. Uh, also uh, companies that uh, correct do accent removal by AI. So if they go back they tell you to say something and then go back and tell you to say some words you don't pronounce right. AI that helps people target their uh, weak areas foundationally in mathematics and so on. Um, so all of these are ways that will eventually demonetize education and make it more uh, broadly uh, appealing. Also, but at the same time, it's pushing teachers to be more the human to human interface, right? So because the the, the routine work like accent removal, math 
um, a math um, exam grading um, grading yeah. uh, are done by machines. The manual, so, the manual boring stuff. Right. So the yeah. teachers will be able to do more hand uh, uh, one to one. So the interesting outcome is that I think there will be a lot of AI that can reach um, people who can't afford uh, most expensive education. But at the same time, those people who want to pay more will actually get more people attention. So there will still be tiers of education available, but I do think at a broad level, we can give a lot better education to a lot more people. Let me, uh, on the education front, because I have <coughs> two seven-year-old kids, I think about this a lot. I, there's a company here that I'm very excited about, based here in LA, um, that uh, uh, I'm looking at for an investment. What it does is it, if you have a lot of information, like in my abundance digital program, I've got you know hundreds of hours of content that I teach, and I have hundreds of hours of conversations like this digitized, my books, my mm. blogs, and so forth. It takes all of this digital information and it trains up a, a simulated AI of you. Yeah, yeah. Have you seen companies like that uh, in, in, in China? No, not yet. So not yet. that's I mean, a good one. Yeah. And so the notion yeah. that eventually, so uh, Tony Robbins has been looking at this, given how much content he's created, Ray Dalio and others, yeah. Yeah. that you can create an AI that's, yeah. you know, if you want to have a conversation with Tony before you go into a job interview to get yeah. sort of psyched up, yeah. this AI can do a one-to-one -one training. Yeah. But yeah. the other part of it is I think about uh, in the future, if my kids want to go and learn about the works of, of Plato, they could go into a virtual world and see an AI version of Plato mm. trained on all mm. of his writings. Yes, I, I think those are all possible in the future. Uh, we are looking at some companies that are doing kind of the directive version of that. That is the teacher is pre-programmed uh, because conversations are harder because the, the, the student can ask anything. Mm -hmm. And even though you may have taught for a thousand hours, it doesn't cover everything. And the, a few times that your answer doesn't match may create a bad experience. Mm -hmm. So uh, another way to start, to kickstart this, is to say, well, the lesson today is to teach people the following, uh, you know, 10 words or 10 cities. And then the teacher is directive in teaching and then asks the student questions. So like today we're going to learn about fruits. This is an apple. This is an orange. This is a pear. Let's do a practice. Um, say something about the fruit. Right. And then the student says something and you correct the errors. Mm -hmm. That would be a lot easier to do mm -hmm. because the teacher is directive. You don't have to handle anything from any subject from the student. Right. That tends to be the Chinese way of entrepreneurship. Start with uh, something absolutely doable. Con constrained and constrained, blocked. Constrained and then yeah. grow over time. But I think we're headed to the same ultimate vision. So Michael asks, as someone not born in China, how can you learn or break into the market as an entrepreneur? Very tough. I don't recommend it. Um, uh, just as someone from China wanting to come to do a startup company in the U.S., very hard. Uh, if you look at all the... But if I were giving that, that Chinese student, I would say, come to the U.S., yes. go through a U.S. Pr uh, university program, yes. find a co-founder, Right. And start. I mean, I, I that would seen, work. Yeah. Yes. So the only Chinese founders that succeed in the U.S. are those who've done what you've said. So the converse is true. If you want, really want to be committed to China, you know, go over there, study, find a co-founder. Those are the ways to go. Uh, but if you've already founded a company that has very core, non-culture dependent uh, technologies, you could look at the partnership at a company level. Like if you develop the greatest. Um, whatever, avatar-making technology that can create what um, uh, Peter talked about mm -hmm. in the, the teacher, then license that technology to a company in China and either get royalties or shares in a joint venture and let someone else there run it. Because as in my, I said in my book, in AI superpowers, US and China are almost parallel universes. Uh, to be able to, be, to travel between parallel universes is very tough. But to license your technology to someone in another universe that is the simplest way. You need a starship like the Enterprise and, you know, the yeah. lithium crystals and it just gets difficult. Yes. I mean, have there been any good examples of U.S. companies that have gone into China and established themselves as a leader in an industry? Well, Apple is a great example. But it's got, yeah, okay, so the Apple, the iPhone is still, 
the phone of mm -hmm. the wealthiest in China. Yes, yes. Uh, and did it do that because of the relationship with Foxconn or just was a better product? No, it was just a better product. So if you can be Apple, you've got a shot. Microsoft is pretty solid in China, as are you know, Oracle, SAP, IBM. So if you've got something to offer that's not available in China, that's possible, um, but in the consumer internet space, it's really hard to name even one company. Hmm. Interesting. So um, Matt asks, how do you guys feel about universal basic income, and how will humans find meaning in a jobless economy? Mm. Okay. I, well, I cover this uh, in AI superpowers as well. I'm, I'm not a big fan of universal basic income. Um, I think it's a noble idea that once we make all this money that replaces all the jobs, then we should tax the rich and give mon people money. I think that general direction is, is okay. But who do you give it to and how do you, what do you give it for? Universal basic income assumes a peanut buttering of money to all the people equally, mm. to the needy and the non-needy. And, and I think that's too extravagant because you know $10,000 to each person in the US, that's $3 trillion a year. How, do you, how, are, we, how are we gonna tax that much money? The, but beyond that, there's the issue of when you give someone money in this kind of a huge job transition, I think with it comes the responsibility of helping to guide the person to a new career. So um, the money could be applied much better to people who are uh, retraining for a job that isn't replaceable by AI or providing um, um, elderly care, volunteering, homeschooling. So incentives towards that, I think, would sort of incent the behavior. But also, I think, the, as, as the person who asked the question mentioned, um, the meaning is very important, right? People's, too many people um, believe work is the meaning of their lives. And as long as, obviously in a long time that could shift, but for the next 30 years, we're stuck with that. And for people who believe that, that if a job is taken by automation and the person sees that anything he or she can do is gonna be done better by AI or automation, suddenly, even if there's UBI that, 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 that removes the economic drain, the person is going to feel um, very uh, demotivated, even depressed, subject to substance abuse or addiction to uh, games and VR. It's just not a good combination. So I, I, think, um, uh, I think we have to really think it's not that the AI and automation is not just displacing jobs that's taking away income. It's displacing meaning for a lot of people and injecting that meaning back by retraining, by volunteerism, by doing meaningful activities to the society and finding um, back to, to the way on their feet, those are the kinds of the right subsidies uh, and programs to put trillions of dollars into if we yeah. have that much money. Let, let me add on to, uh, to that, Matt, to what uh, Dr. Lee said. Um, at the end of the day, uh, I'm not worried about loss of jobs, not allowing people to get access to food, energy, water, healthcare, and so forth. We're rapidly demonetizing all of those things. It's becoming cheaper and better and better all the time. Uh, there is a lot of people who give meaning to their life by virtue of what they do. They say, my great-grandfather was a bricklayer, my father was a bricklayer, I was a bricklayer, now these damn robots are laying the bricks better than I can, and so that lo is lost there. So a couple of things that are important there, and uh, I'll just mention them. Number one, uh, one of the ideas that I'm thinking about, because I spend a lot of time with Tony Robbins thinking about the future of work and the future of meaning in, uh, in these future of work is, um, it may not be universal basic income, it may be universal basic ownership of a type. And let me just mention this idea that in the future, if I was an Uber driver and my car is uh, all of a sudden autonomous, maybe I'm a part owner in that autonomous Uber that's going around delivering uh, people rides so that it's a fleet of robots who are in part working for me and I'm earning my living through those robots that, and so it's just, think about it, if you were the king and the queen and the meaning you had was your individuals, uh, if your workforce working for you are these robots the potential. The second thing is we spend a lot of time 
Uh, if, if you're not a member of Abundance Digital and, and you choose to become a member, we spend a lot of time talking about what is your massively transformative purpose? What is it that you're alive to do? Because if you're driven by a mission and a purpose, the technologies are always going to change, but you're driven by that purpose and you'll figure out new ways uh, to fulfill on that purpose. Uh, as the technology is becoming more and more powerful. And, and ultimately, this is the world we're living in. It's the most exciting time ever to be alive. But if you don't have a meaning and a purpose in your life, you're not going to have a chance to tap into that excitement ever. So purpose, mm -hmm. and then what is your moonshot? What drives you? What wakes you up in the morning? These are the things that are, are critically important uh, to master on page zero, line one. Right? Yeah. Great. I agree. Got time for two more questions. All right. Uh, the first one comes from Pedro, who asks, "What are your thoughts on privacy in AI? What will be private in the future, if anything?" Mm. Uh, that's a great question, and yeah. I, let me just—I'm going to answer it first, and Please. then I want to see your point of view because I think privacy is in part a function of of cultural expectations. Mm -hmm. Uh, we didn't have privacy thousands of years ago. There are countries in the world where one does not assume privacy. And I know that a lot of technology right now, like um, maybe it's not Face++, but uh, there's, there's companies, there's software like LipNet that can read, uh, read lips from, from videos. Yeah. Uh, I can go shake your hand, grab a couple of your skin cells and sequence you and know everything about your medical past and future. Uh, so, and ultimately I have, to, I have to teach my seven-year-old boys that whatever's captured uh, on Facebook or Instagram could be there for the rest of their lives. We behave differently when we're being observed, uh, which is a good thing. And lack of privacy to some degree is what lets me sleep at night because it's harder for people to do evil things when they're being watched. My point of view is, Talk, what's the, what's the perceived point of view if you're willing and able to mm -hmm. say in China and from an, from an AI yeah. uh, you know, uh, world expert, how do you see this? Yeah, I think sometimes when people talk privacy, they want to just keep everything to, they, they want their cake and eat it too. You can't have the conveniences of Facebook and Amazon if you don't give them any of your data. So. I think it is reasonable for, for there to be a protocol and regulations on what data you can permit them to capture or not. And I think Europe's GDPR is Europe's version of that. My guess is US will have a looser version of that. My guess is China Agreed. will have an even looser version of that, mm -hmm. but there should be something. Mm -hmm. And then there is the selling of your data for things that you didn't intend to uh, authorize, such as Facebook to an, uh, Cambridge Analytica. Yeah. And I think those things ought to be taken even more seriously because that is uh, clearly um, transgressing on whatever authority or licensing we gave to, to, to Facebook. And in fact, uh, China takes that very seriously. Selling or giving away data by one company to another about its users is actually considered criminal and subject to uh, imprisonment. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I think that's something to also uh, consider maybe taking a more harsher way to, to avoid that from happening. Fantastic. One last question, and this is actually one that is beyond technology, is much more human in nature. Amir asks, how did you, Kaifu, overcome cancer? What life lessons did you learn being so close to death? Well, I was a workaholic. I attached my life meaning to work. And I think the first, the most important lesson I learned from cancer was that uh, this was wrong. And that when I faced death that could be months away, I found that I had no desire to work uh, at all. That all of the things that meant everything to me all of a sudden meant nothing. Mm. And what was important were the people I love and uh, to be around them, to give love to them and, and recognize in the past that I had failed to do that. So. So I decided to change my uh, 997 <laughs> work <laughs> habits. And I spent a lot more time with my family and friends. And actually, I prioritized them higher. Probably that's even more important than the number of hours. Mm -hmm. uh, I used to you know, do everything uh, work required. Then whatever I was free, I gave to my family. Now I see when my family needs me, and I attend to that first. 
then what's left I give to work. Of course, my family's understanding, they don't demand six days a, a week. You know, they, uh, my wife, you know, there's anniversary, birthday, and, and so on. And, and uh, when she needs help, when the kids are home on vacation, I actually take off um, for them, regardless of what's happening at work. So it changes those priorities. Also, the other thing I was aware, I'm aware of now is that health is incredibly important. Without that, we, we have nothing. Yeah. So I'm a big admirer of a lot of the work that Peter has been and is doing Thank in uh, longevity and health. And, uh, and we're also looking at how AI can, can contribute to that. There's a great quote uh, a friend of mine, Joe Paula, shared with me. God knows, maybe it's a Chinese quote. It says, the man uh, who has their health has a thousand dreams. Uh, the man or woman who does not has but one dream. Mm. And it's mm. so, so true. Yeah. Uh, Kaifu, thank you, my friend. Thank, thank you, you for your generosity. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for uh, this fantastic book, uh, AI Superpowers, and I commend it to everybody here. Uh, we'll talk about this in the Abundance Digital community, I'm sure, at length. Um, September is going to be a rich, uh, a rich month for webinars. Uh, on uh, next, this coming Thursday, September 6th at 11 a.m. Pacific time, in just a, in a couple of days. I'm going to be sitting down with Gabriel uh, Rene, who's founder and executive di director of the Versus Foundation. So I want you to think about uh, the combination of, uh, of VR, uh, AI, and blockchain. Uh, and sort of the, if you saw Ready Player One, it's sort of the future of the Oasis. And uh, Versus is working on creating sort of uh, uh, HTML for the three-dimensional uh, uh, virtual world. And what, what's enabled there? Is it going to be some place where we spend a lot of our time working, playing, thinking, teaching our kids, and so forth? So uh, get ready to dive into sort of the modern day earliest roots of uh, Oasis well, from Ready Player One. Um, and then... Uh, we're going to be uh, going there to on uh, September the 14th, uh, a phenomenal uh, webinar with a, a dear friend of both of ours, Ray Kurzweil. We'll be talking about brain-computer interface. That's going to be at 12 noon, again, for our Abundance Digital members. Uh, Ray and I are going to be talking about many of the same subjects, but going on deep dive into human longevity. Mm -hmm. We're going to be in a deep dive into brain-computer interface. Uh, we'll be, I'll be asking Ray about uh, what, you know, why does he think 2029 is the year mm -hmm. that we're going to have human-level intelligence and what is the singularity and why he's been able to pretty consistently make predictions about the future. So uh, he'll be there to answer your questions as, as well. And then finally, our third webinar is with a dear friend, Jim Giannopoulos, who's the chairman and CEO of Paramount Films, uh, previously the chairman and CEO of Fox. He's the guy who greenlit Avatar. And we're going to talk about you know, the current and future of the uh, motion picture industry, how, again, AI is starting to render characters and what we're going to be doing in the virtual world, and I'm going to be nailing him on where this Paramount doing with their Star Trek uh, properties and, and films. So a lot of fun this month. Uh, please uh, join me, and if you're, not, if you're not a member of Abundance Digital, I commend you to join. These are the conversations we have every day uh, that will change your life. It's about, you know, it's really, I think, I think you appreciate this, Kaifu, uh, our lives are who we go through life with. It's a community we spend time with. Absolutely. Uh, and so if you happen to be in a place where you don't have people talking about all these exponential technologies and going after your passion, creating a community or being part of a community where you can have those conversations is, is critically more important than ever before. Yeah, I think what you're doing with uh, abundance is phenomenal. Thank you, my That's friend. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for spending time with us. Thanks. See you, everybody. See you very soon. Bye-bye.